You mentioned that the pretty please wrap video crossed a line. Why not let Singaporeans determine where the line is? I mean, somebody in society will say this is a line and everybody else will agree. Now, you were just 29 when you became MP for Sabawang GRC. What was that like? Okay, I wouldn't recommend it to anyone else. <laughs> I didn't know what I was getting into. It's a whole learning curve. I think it's useful to be a bit older than 29. What's the toughest choice you've had to make as the Law and Home Affairs Minister? I would say if I have to choose one off the top of my head without having thought about it, I didn't make the law, but capital punishment is there. I defend it, but it is uh, tough being responsible in a responsible position. I believe that it is necessary, but it's nevertheless tough. I understand that you are in the same team as Hua Jie uh, in Nishun GRC. So I wanted to ask, what do you think about Sister Flower Li Bi Wa? <laughs> well, I think BY, you either, you know, really like her or as some people don't like her, but most people like her. I have a very high opinion of her. She speaks her mind. She works very hard. She's one of our hardest working MPs. Though, you know, there are people who get upset with what she says. But I think that's a minority. Racial tensions are pretty high in the States and around the world. What is your opinion on racism in Singapore? You show me a country or name me a country which is multi-ethnic and where there is no racism. In my view, it's not possible. There is racism in every country. What is happening in the US, there is a history to it. There is a certain culture of a speech surrounding race. We cannot deny there is racism, but within the small confines of Singapore with our own history, it's a very different lived experience for us. Do you think there is a generational divide in how racism in Singapore is interpreted and reacted to? Rather than saying older or younger generation, until the recent events in the US, for a while, younger as well as older people were saying, almost talking about it like we are in a post-race society. Why does race matter? We are all, you know, one. And uh, it's people like me who used to say, hey, the fault lines are there. It's just that, you know, you don't often realize it. By and large, I think most people recognize, are we perfect? No. Are there racists amongst us? Yes. But on the whole, both the government and the people trying to deal with it and trying to create a better society, I think the answer is yes. You mentioned that the Pretty Please rap video crossed a line. Why not let Singaporeans determine where that line is? I mean, somebody in society will say this is a line and everybody else will agree. Do you think that's even workable? That's the approach that the US takes. And you see why it has led them to. You see, these ideas are nice sounding. Why don't we let Singaporeans determine? Singaporeans elect us. We deal with important issues. We say, okay, this is where we think the line ought to be after studying the issues. It is for us to explain it to Singaporeans and then for Singaporeans to either accept or reject it. This can't be shoved down, you know, the throats of anyone. It's got to be a process where you discuss and you agree. So we won't be able to convince everyone. It's a question of whether you can convince a majority. You have quite an intimidating reputation, but what or who do you fear? Ah. <laughs> you ask yourself, where does fear come from? This is going to be a bit philosophical. Fear comes from attachment. You like something, you're attached to something, then you fear that you're going to lose it. So if you take a view that everything in life is transient, then you just go about doing what you think you need to do. You've been a law minister for 12 years. So do you think that laws have to evolve as opinions change? Like LGBT rights is something that has gained more awareness and support over the past few years. So will laws like 377A also change? The laws have to have support of people. So laws must reflect the will of the people, but that doesn't mean that it always follows. Laws like 377A deal with the personal lives of people. But uh, when you are in a policy making role, you've got to look at what the majority viewpoint is, majority of our society, somewhere upwards of 60% or more. The social mores are such that there is no support for repeal of 377A. Recently in parliament, I made a specific mention of the gay community. If people of the gay community are attacked or harassed, we will take action. Just like people of a religious persuasion or religious denomination are attacked, we will also take action. 
So we will protect everybody, including the gay community. Can there be tougher punishments for the university cases involving sexual misconduct? The law has got to be equal to all. Overall, our punishments are quite strict. It shouldn't matter whether you're undergrad or non-undergrad, whether you're doing it in the university or outside. Everyone is entitled to protection, everyone is entitled to privacy, and if somebody breaches it, they should be dealt with severely. I think people misunderstand the submissions by defense lawyers sometimes. Not just in these sorts of cases, in every case, a judge has got to look whether there are factors that require some consideration, but he's got to weigh that against sending a message to society, he's got to weigh that against making sure that this chap never offends again. So sometimes in the way it's reported, it looks as if, oh, you know, if you are better educated, you get off scot-free. No, the law has got to be the same and is the same for all. What's one law you would introduce or get rid of on a personal level? You know, I'm trying to think right now about one law out of so many to be introduced or in the pipeline or to remove. I'll tell you one law or two laws that I'm very, very happy that I introduced recently. The laws where we strengthen the protection for vulnerable victims. And in particular, a category that was not clearly recognized, intimate partners. That gave me a lot of uh, satisfaction in changing the laws and a whole lot of laws, what I would call ancillary protection to support the victim. And then more recently, you know, we put in this uh, rental relief legislation. You're talking about 250 odd thousand SMEs, jobs were at risk, businesses were at risk. So saving the tears and uh, disaster, at least, for a period of time, as we assess, I think gave me a lot of satisfaction. You have been the MP for Chompang for more than 30 years. Uh, what eateries and stalls should one check out when he or she visits Chompang? Lots, a uh, great place. Through COVID, many of them remain open. You know, you name it, they've got some of the best food there for carrot cake. The duck rice is very well known. Family food, the prata. Many restaurants are going under. What is being done to prevent more of our favorite shops from closing? Many businesses, big and small, but particularly the SMEs and smaller businesses, they are facing tremendous pressure. And even when it restarts, it's not going to come back, zoom back to 100% or more immediately. So it's a very tough environment. We have had a whole slew of policies. And in addition, we had the legislation on rental relief. The virus is a common enemy. We've got to look at the virus, manage it, and start as quickly as possible, but safely. Why does rental relief for SMEs only cover the two months during circuit breaker? What about during phase one, when many businesses are still not allowed to operate? Relief is for four months. Government gives two months to the landlord on behalf of the tenant. The landlord is required to give another two months, so four months off. And the tenant is given a moratorium in addition to the four months if they needed additional time, moratorium up to October. That's the current scheme. What's your take on the unfair and unfriendly behaviour from landlords that tenants have been lamenting about? I think we should be careful about characterising all landlords as the big bad wolves. Our survey shows that 60% of the landlords, even before the government passed legislation, many of them had given rental reliefs on their own. About 40% didn't do so or did so on a smaller basis. But on the whole, our view was that the tenants, because of business conditions, are facing the greater risk at this point in time. And uh, we had substantial buy-in from landlords for that perspective. And that's why we passed the legislation requiring four months rental relief. What is your favourite dog breeds and how are your dogs? Well, the favourite dog is the very first one that I adopted, who has passed away since. It's a Singapore dog. But you know, all, all the dogs are good. Well, those which are alive are good. <laughs> since working for home is the default, are there regulations to ensure working from home is adhered to? Even with employers who much rather prefer their employees being in the office. We are a free market economy and we've got to understand that wealth is created not by government, by the private sector, by employers. And they know how to do business. But at the same time, there are employers who may not be so responsible. So we need to have a framework but I think we've got to avoid trying to be too prescriptive. Employers need to know that if there is an outbreak in their premises, they are going to be shut down, so they're going to suffer even more. So it's better for them to be careful up front. Why does it feel like there were more crimes committed during the circuit breaker period? 
Uh, that's not quite accurate. Uh, I mean, for obvious reasons, crimes that take place in public, right? Everyone is staying at home, so people are unlikely to break into other people's homes. Stuff like that has gone down. But uh, unfortunately, violence within a family setting, violence within home setting has increased. Scams have increased. I don't think that's because of the circuit breaker. That's simply because more people are online. Scams, we have to try and do public education. Familial violence, we had also strengthened the law on that. We need to move in quickly when there are issues at home. What would you say to the silver lady if you ever met her in person? I said that if you know, if she meant what she said, then people like that, it's difficult to live in a society because you rely on an entire social structure, the police force, everyone to keep the peace, then you go around. So how can you say you're sovereign? Looking at what she said, there is probably more to it than meets the eye. What I was meaning is probably one has got to look at her own personal circumstances. I don't want to go too much into it because the case is sort of, you know, in court. Back in 2018, you viewed PJ Tang for six hours at the select committee hearing. Do you think you should have grilled him for the whole day instead or less? It's not a question of how many hours, it's a question of the subject, how long it takes and uh, the quality of the answers. If a person refuses to answer a question or is being dishonest or is being evasive, then you've got to ask him and then put it to him that he is refusing to answer and that takes time. Anyway, he admitted that the way he summarized the evidence was misleading. If you got quarantined, what would you do to pass your time? Well, my work doesn't get quarantined. I've got my laptop. It's a 24-7, apart from sleeping. I work from home, I, but mine is also considered an essential job, so I come in for meetings. But I didn't find the work going down. In fact, it went up. More people were on emails. So the submissions come on email, we respond on email, policies get made, work doesn't stop. So I'm sure that will happen when I'm in quarantine too. I know there are a lot of people who might wish that I wouldn't do it. And hopefully, you know, home affairs will not function for a while, but I don't think that's a majority.